Welcome to Encounter Grace, where we come face to face with God's work in the world for our good. Join host Jason McKnight as we explore practical issues of community, theology, and leadership in everyday life. Welcome to Encounter Grace. I'm Jason McKnight, and we're back with Amy Gannett in part two of our interview. Amy, welcome back. Thanks. Well, if you missed part one, go back and catch it, and you'll hear all that God is doing through tiny theologians and verse-by-verse studies and so forth. But for now, let's get personal. (laughs) Amy, let's talk a little bit. Okay, we're going to go all the way back to last Saturday. Okay. All right. What does a Saturday look like in the Gannett household? I mean, I'm, I'm imagining all sorts of crazy things. What what goes on on a Sabbath? Is Wait, is Saturday a Sabbath for you guys? Well, we take, so we take Fridays off because Sundays are a work day. Right. Um, so our Sabbath day, our day of rest is generally Fridays. Okay. Let's and, talk Friday then. Yeah. So Fridays for us, um, we actually gained this from you. Um, Saturdays and Fridays and Sundays, whatever part of a day is a day of rest. It's about what we get to do, not what we have to do. And in our home, this is maybe slightly less true of me than it is of my borderline OCD husband, but we <laughs> like to clean. So Friday mornings, we, we let the baby sleep as long as she will. We sit on the couch and we have coffee together. Um, we often will open Pinterest and look at Pinterest together. And once the baby's up, we start cleaning. We love a clean house. We love a clean house. But it probably so, doesn't take you that long. There's only two and a half of you. does not take very long. I mean, there's three, um, but... <laughs> <that's right. laughs> It doesn't take very long, and I am so grateful that the Lord gave me a man who loves to clean because he probably does the lion's share of the cleaning in our house um, because he enjoys it so much. Because you're he, looking at Pinterest. That's right. I'm, at, I'm on Pinterest still. Huh. But he enjoys cleaning so much so that for his 30th birthday, you know, here is this like landmark birthday. I was like, what do you want to do? Don't you know, like me. We can like go to Charleston. We could, you know, like go visit friends oh. in Colorado. What do you want to do? He asked for a vacuum for his 30th birthday. And I thought this is such a boring birthday gift. (laughs) But do you know how many times I've benefited from this birthday gift? I'm so thankful he is the kind of guy who wants a vacuum for his 30th birthday. Well, maybe you should have picked it up in Charleston. That's right, maybe we should have, (laughs) but we didn't. It just came and he was so excited. He put it together right away and started vacuuming. So Friday mornings we clean and then Friday morning breakfast is our date time. Okay. Um, we have a newborn. We with COVID stuff, we haven't really had babysitters come around. We don't yeah, um, have true. a lot of like college students that have come and stayed with Emerson in the evenings and stuff like that. So evening dates we kept trying to find a time where we could have a regular date night. Um, it just wasn't happening. And that was okay. It didn't feel like a bur- it felt more like a burden to find a time to go on a date. Um, and that felt kind of unnecessary to fight that fight. So yeah, yeah. we decided Friday mornings when she falls asleep in her car seat, we will go get breakfast together. And she usually gives us about an hour. And so we'll go have coffee, go have breakfast. Um, notice on our day off, I've mentioned coffee twice. That yes, is very I was going to For our Friday mornings. So are y'all still roasting beans? We do. We home roast and we love roasting coffee. That's what we have throughout the entire week. But yeah, there is my, something. I'll give you my address so you can send them. <laughs> There is something special, though, about going to a place that will roast the beans and make you that cup of coffee. So that's what Friday mornings look like. And we like running errands. So Friday afternoons, we run errands. We usually make homemade pizza for dinner on Friday night. Oh. Um, and so since we've had breakfast out, we kind of skip lunch and wait and do homemade pizza. Um, and then we usually watch a movie or a show that we're really enjoying. We're just... Um, right now, we're in a sweet spot where uh-huh. The Mandalorian releases a new episode On every Friday. Friday. So we do homemade pizza and The Mandalorian. Um, and we we love it. We are homebodies to the core. So we can be at home cleaning. We can be at home playing with Emerson on the floor. We can be at home working in the garage. We love being home. So Fridays are usually just home days and family days. Home is a refuge. It really is. Uh, that is so good. What I do have to ask you on the pizzas, is it one pizza for the both of you or individual and different toppings? It's the same. same. We okay. we have differences. So on food, we are very similar. And so we do a pepperoni pizza every Friday with fresh basil and it... You can't find a, you can't order a better pizza than it. It's wonderful. So I'd love to do this interview again in two years and see okay. if it's anything other than pepperoni and fresh okay. basil. Okay, okay. We could, we'll do that. I'll hold you to it. We could have a little fun on that. Okay, so Austin, your husband, is um, he's such a great friend to you and to many, but mm-hmm. what is it about his friendship that you just gives you life? One of the things that we have... We, Part of the thing that started our relationship was good conversation. We mm. love to talk and discuss things. Um, and, you know, there are friendships where you get together, you just kind of share with each other. Like each person is like um, 
giving out information about their lives, but there's not really an exchange happening. Hmm. It's really just I'm sharing information and you're sharing information. We didn't really connect. Well, from the very beginning, Austin and I have had a great back and forth. We hmm. love to build on each other's ideas. We even love to debate when the occasion arises. Um, usually it's like on a theological point where we right. maybe see things like mildly differently. Um, but we are just, we love to talk. We love to go somewhere. Honestly, a great date for us is just going somewhere and saying, how has your week been? Um, what sort of things are you working through? Yeah. How is your quiet time? What are you learning? And just letting that conversation start or just spur further conversation. We've got a great back and forth. And we could do that, honestly, for hours. That's how our relationship started hmm. when we met in seminary. Um, we had an initial meeting and the next time we found ourselves talking in the cafeteria over lunch, we were sitting next to each other. We talked over lunch and then we looked up and two hours later, the cafeteria was empty and we were like, we really enjoy each other's company. And that yeah. has been the case for our entire marriage. And so, um, that is one of the things that makes him such a great friend to me, but that's really the foundation of our friendship is our ability to communicate and talk with each other and share life that way. That's so good. He, um, you know, he's absolutely one of the most insightful thinkers that I know. Absolutely. So how do you keep up? <laughs> That's a great question. I mean, because you're pretty smart, I, but he's I, so insightful. I don't often... We are wired very differently. Um, insightful is a great word to describe him. A discernment is another one. Mm -hmm. So yeah. where I am, if you've done Strength Finders, I'm an activator. Yes, so you are. I have a thought and I act on it by noon, maybe in five <laughs> different ways. Like maybe I've taken five different stabs at this thought that I've had by noon. He is the opposite. He's going to mull over something and discern. He's going to have insight into that. And so we operate in really different um, capacities, which has been a great partnership. Mm -hmm. I mean, yep. It definitely has caused conflict at times because he's like, why are you like just digging all these stabs at this? We should think it through. And yeah. to be fair, he's mostly right in that regard. Um, but he really, one of the things that I so appreciate about him is that as he reads something, he reads lots of different resources. If you look on his nightstand at any given time, there's five different books on five different topics by five people that fall in different Theological yeah. circles, cultural circles, social circles. I love this about him. But he can take it all in and mull it over. I'm much more easily influenced by something I read. Um, I will be discerning enough to know, well, that's not that doesn't line up with biblical theology or something like that. But I can be so um, drawn in by an author, I'm much more easily compelled. And so one of the things that I just absolutely love about Austin is his ability to take in lots of different inputs and discern and sift it and mull it over in a slower process. So it's really, really one of his strengths. Yeah, and I benefited from it when we worked together for those several mm -hmm. years. I mean, he just just raised the level of the thinking I was doing mm -hmm. just by bouncing it off of him. I love that. And the discernment piece of in ministry and in life, um, so specifically when I think about church planting together and I think about like running a small business, mm -hmm. um, one of the things that discerning people – um, in our lives that operate in close capacity to us. So maybe when you guys work together um, or in our close capacity working together, church planting, or as I'm running the small business and running things by him, is it can feel like the brakes. I can feel like yeah, the gas. Yes. He can feel like the brakes. Mm -hmm. But one of the things I've learned is that it really, discerning people, insightful people really help people like us who like to take action steps. Mm -hmm. They really are just helping us count the cost of what we've right. been called to. Right. Um, so I'm called to our tiny theologians. We are called to plant a church. We're called to do different stages of different, take different steps in church planting, different steps in running a small business, in writing an online ministry. But that discernment really helps us pull back and say, is this what God is calling me to? And if so, we don't want to be people of cheap calling. It helps us count the cost of what God has called us to so that we do it with excellence, yep. so that we do it in a way that honors the, the God of the calling. So um, it really has benefited my ministry individually, but it definitely is such a safeguard in our ministry of church planting together. Yeah, so true. Who else lives in your home? A little Emerson Grace. Emerson Grace. What is it like being a mom? Like, what's been ex unexpected to you? Um, I was raised in a big family, so I've always been around babies. So there weren't yeah, a lot of yep. things about, like, a newborn that were super unexpected to me, I guess. Um, but I think, what is, I think two things surprised me. The first is going to sound really calloused. But I think everybody told us that when it's your own kid, you're just going to love them so much, you have no idea. 
And I sort of thought, I mean, I've just been around kids. Like, kids right. are kids. Right. And I had no idea how this girl mm. would wrap us around her finger so quickly. Mm -hmm. um, we do just love her. I mean, she can have such a fussy day, and I watch her sleep on the monitor at night. <laughs> and I'm like, I just love her so much. I just want to go wake her up and spend time with her, which <laughs> is bonkers. It's literally yeah. crazy when she hasn't slept all day. And, of course, we've got to sleep and stuff. But to think, I just want to be with her. I miss her. Mm -hmm. And she's in the other room. So... Um, the affection that came so instinctively was a real surprise and delight to me. Yeah, yeah. Um, so that was a big part of it. I think the other um, piece of it, I, I'm not sure how much sure, I'm not sure how much of this was parenting or the season in which Emerson was born. Um, so for us, we were working from home for a few weeks before Emerson was born. We had transitioned to working in Greenville where we're church planting. Right. Austin had previously been um, commuting back here to Kinston, to Grace, and working out of the offices here. And then about four weeks before Emerson was born, we transitioned to working from home full time. And then Emerson was born and we were all home. And even though we sort of had some ideas about Austin um, working out of the home, I mean, then COVID hit. Yeah. And so we were new parents, newly working from home, new church planters, and newly sheltering in place at home. Right. And so I think one of the biggest challenges of parenting has been how do we measure our callings? We know we're called to parent her. We know that we're called to church plan. We, I know I'm called to run this small business. And so sometimes those things feel in conflict. But the Lord has shown us time and again in this season is that really we have to um, prioritize our callings in different areas seasons and in different times of the day so when emerson's up and she is playing she needs our attention she needs mm -hmm. my attention um and so i can prioritize that calling of parenting then and then when she is taking a nap um, or when she's content to play on her own i can prioritize church planting and so learning how to do that was a big surprise now again i'm not sure how much of that is just parenting or just this season of now I'm living in this space, working in this space, parenting in this space, and we rarely leave now. You know, right. so how much of it is that, uh, yeah. and how much of it is being a parent? But that was a surprise. But it has been stretching in a really good way. Austin and I said um, just this last week that we are not the same people that we were before Emerson was born, and it's not just that we took on a new role. It's yeah. that this new role of parenting has really chiseled into us new habits and traits, and I think most of them for our betterment and for God's glory. Um, but it really has shaped us and mm -hmm. challenged us in new ways. Yeah, you have a whole new identity. Hmm. And you just weren't, you weren't a mom before. Yep, it's true. And, and it's a, it's a God-given beautiful thing. Um, uh, okay, so one more question about home. And uh, this is really fun because I have seen this, um, the Sunday night cheese board mm -hmm. tradition. What is that? Where does that come from? What are you doing there? Yeah. Are you still doing it? I we, don't even know. Of course we do. Okay, I thought so. Of but. course we do. <laughs> um, so when we first got married, um, we kind of grew into this bad habit of being weekend warriors. Um, we were very busy during the week. I was still a seminary student. Austin was working at the seminary. Um, and I was also working full time. So I would nanny before classes, starting at 6 a.m., take the kids to school, go to my classes, then I'd pick the kids up from school, and then stay with them until like 7.30, and then come home. And Austin and I would have dinner together. So we really ended up living for the weekends. Hmm. Um, but when you live for the weekends, a problem comes, because the weekend doesn't last forever. Yeah. So it, you know, it'd usually be, it started kind of to, I started to feel this anxiety like Sunday afternoons like the weekend's almost over and we're going right. to step back into the chaos mm -hmm. of our weekly schedule it felt like stepping into a current and then the weekend felt like stepping out of it okay so now we have to fight against this current and now we're stepping out of it over the weekend so I used to start feeling that anxiety on Sunday afternoons um, and then it kind of snuck into like Sunday mornings. I'd wake up and be like, oh, that was my last morning to get extra sleep. And if I didn't sleep in, it felt like a waste of a weekend. And then that anxiety would creep back even further to like Saturday uh. nights and then Saturday afternoons and to the point where it would be Saturday mornings. And if I didn't sleep well, Friday to Saturday, I felt like the weekend was a bust. Huh. But that's what happens when you put all your hope in the weekend. Yep. Um, yep. Yep. And so if all your hope is in 
having the best weekend ever, you're always waiting for something to go wrong, Mm -hmm. like to Mm -hmm. disappoint you. Mm -hmm. Um, And so we decided to strategically place something sort of ceremonial. We're both very ceremonial creatures. We love a liturgy. We love a habit. We love a rhythm for life. And so we decided to put play something ceremonial, something that we would look forward to and something intentional relationally at the very end of our weekend. Mm -hmm. Um, And it did something really wonderful for us. So not only was that time of having a cheese board really great face-to-face time for us, it was really great interacting time for us. Um, We got to review our week behind and look at the week ahead. All of those things were wonderful. We ate some of our favorite foods. Um, You know, all of those things were great. But it did something sort of like almost um, magical to the rest of the weekend because there was always something to look forward to. It made the weekend feel longer and it made our rest feel more intentional. Mm. So instead of waking up Saturday morning and feeling like all this pressure was placed on my Saturday, um, because everything felt shortened, instead it gave this anticipation of something good coming. And so Austin and I really loved that practice, but also gave us a metaphor for all of life. Um, we don't want to be people who are just living for here and now. The best really is coming. Yeah, like Christ yeah, is yeah, on yeah. his way and he has even pictured it as the wedding supper of the lamb. There is a feast awaiting us in heaven. And so that makes this life um, and ministry, our lives today, we get to say they feel long because Jesus is coming and we can yeah. savor his goodness and work towards the coming of his kingdom, um, bringing his kingdom to earth as he teaches us to pray in the Lord's prayer. Mm-hmm. We get to work towards these things because we're still looking ahead to what is to come. So every Sunday night, um, we have our cheese board, our charcuterie, and what started in seminary, I was like, maybe like string cheese and some Ritz, you know, like we were on like that shoestring budget, right? What now we know the foods we like to eat. We know yep. some yep. cheeses that are, you know, maybe we're just discovering or some old favorites. And we just love making an intentionally beautiful board um, and eating it face to face and eating it in our living room. And um, it's just a really sweet tradition that we've yeah. developed. Traditions are important. Liturgy, I mean, the Liturgy of the Ordinary, I think you put us onto that mm-hmm. book. It's such a good idea, um, concept, framework, um, because, you know, we just can't go from excitement to excitement. Mm-hmm. You have to have troughs we to do. run in and the water to run in. Well, let's shift gears a little bit and reflect a little bit on celebrity. Because, you know, here you are, um, you know, honestly, every pastor or leader in a local church can be a celebrity if they're not mm. careful. And it's mm-hmm. a bad thing. Mm-hmm. So you and Austin are planting a church, and he's the pastor of a church, and it's a great little church growing, but you could be a celebrity there. But then also in the ministry and the calling God's given you with tiny theologians and verse-by-verse studies that we've seen and, and so forth, followers on Twitter and, and creating a community online. Um, <laughs> and the reason I'm asking you about, well, what does this mean, celebrity? How are you wrestling? Is because, yeah, man... A couple of months ago, we see just yet another pastor. And I mean, just wait four more weeks, we'll see another uh, quote-unquote famous Mm -hmm. pastor. I don't know if if you're allowed even to have famous pastors. Maybe that's a contradiction Mm -hmm. in terms, but they're there. All right, I've done a lot of talking. How are you reflecting on the growing fame or notoriety or influence or footprint and then the dangers that go with it? Just you personally. Yeah, I think one of the most essential tools when you have an online presence um, and a local church ministry is to really distinguish the definition between the two. And I Mm. have different callings in different spheres, and they have different levels of priority. And I have different roles in those different spheres. So in my local church context, my my role at Trinity Church not is not only to be a member, because I am, I'm a sheep in the flock, yep. but I'm also the director of discipleship. So I oversee children's ministry, women's ministry, and small group ministry for Trinity Church. Um, and that is a priority and a calling on my life. I think we have done a disservice a lot of times when we say um, that online presence isn't a calling. I think... A lot of times we say only local church ministry matters. What we do online doesn't have lasting value. It doesn't matter. And so just focus on the local church. I see the heartbeat behind that. The heartbeat is to say, we don't need these vanity metrics. I don't care who has liked my post X number of times. Selfies aren't forever. Yes, I would say yes and amen to all of that. Um, But if we decide 
and articulate and teach others that online ministry doesn't matter, the danger isn't that it's not influential. It's that we don't know the influence that we are having. And so I really work hard to distinguish what my callings are and what my role is in different spheres. So in my local church, um, I am teaching, I am leading, I am um, helping people better understand biblical doctrines as they have questions, I'm answering them because that is our, those are the people that God has entrusted to us. So for example, um, and, and they're my real friends. Yeah, like yeah, they really are right my there. friends. And so as they're wrestling through stuff in their marriage, I am there for them. Um, I want to help them understand marriage from a biblical perspective. And I want to listen. I want to enter into the burden of um, thinking through things with them well and mm-hmm. feeling the emotional pains that come with difficult seasons of marriage because they're my friends. And because they're entrusted to us as a stewardship, we want to answer the theological questions that they have and do that well and help them find thriving ministries and point them in the direction of good resources and not bad resources and that sort of thing. Um, So ministry in the local church context, for me, the part of the calling is to receive the people that God has entrusted to us and respond to the needs while also leading them in the direction that God has called Austin and the elders to lead the the yeah. entire church into how can we be a part of moving this whole thing forward so that's my calling with trinity church and in the online world it's different um i'm not in the same way like with trinity i let the people that god brings to us set the terms mm. and define the roles and the content in a lot of ways but in the online world that's not the calling part of my stewardship is to define what my role of teaching will look like what god has called me to teach and how i will fill out and occupy this online space. And so I don't let the audience define the terms. I don't let the audience define the content um, because it's too broad and it's too easy to seek vanity metrics and it's too easy to go for itching ears. Mm -hmm. Um, And so instead, I often will decide what the Lord has called me to teach through and I'll teach through that. Um, But I make it pretty clear in a pretty regular basis that I'm not here to be somebody's local church minister. I'm yeah, not here right. to be somebody's best friend because I don't really know you. Um, I'm not your counselor. There's even some legal liability there. I'm not your counselor. This is not advice. I'm not counseling you to make any financial yeah. decisions, mental health decisions, physical health decisions, any of that. Yeah. So I make that very clear online uh, because we can't blur those lines. Um, and so instead of receiving input and responding to it, instead, I just put output and mm. I and I read, like, is this hitting people where they are? That's different than saying you set the terms, yeah, you that's set the right. content. That's right. Um, but the Lord, an itch. Exactly. So it, it's saying, Lord, you've called me to... Um, right now we're doing a study on the family tree of Christ called Grafted In for the month of Advent. Um, so I'm putting that content out there and seeing, oh, that wasn't clear for a good number of people. You know, like 5% of people that were mm-hmm. that joined me for Instagram book club have this question remaining. So let's answer that, you know, because that tells me a good number of people might be confused by that. Um, but I want to steward that online space in a way um, that is, first of all, accountable before God. Um, in deference to my role in the local church. So I really distinguish those two in a different way um, because I think as we define our role, it helps us our, as we define our role online and as we define our role in the church, it really helps us weigh what we're hearing from people yeah. because we don't want to be people that one criticism knocks us down or changes our course. Well, that's what I was going to say. It's like negative feedback. I mean, how do you handle that? It's almost easier online, even though way it maybe easier. is more famous and embarrassing or something. Oh yeah, it's but way. It feels when a more friend public. Hurts but you, it really hurts. Yes, absolutely. And if somebody in my, if somebody in the online world um, were to comment on a post and say, "I'm really disappointed in you," like really, that's like a pat pat. Like yeah. Um, we, we like to say that in Christian circles. Women, Christian women, for some reason, like to say that to other Christian women when they don't agree with them theologically. Mm. We haven't really developed a culture within um, online mm. women's theological circles of saying, I disagree, but respect you. We yeah. like to say, I'm so disappointed in you instead when mm. somebody disagrees theologically. Mm. But if somebody in my church were, and so I can, that's yeah, fine. Yeah. Like, I mean, people say that all the time in the online world. I'm so disappointed in you. And you can say, 
like join the ranks. Like yeah. I'm sure I'm disappointing a lot of people on a That's regular basis. Yep. But now if somebody, if one of my small group leaders comes to me and says, I'm so disappointed in you, that is really a cause for me to go before the Lord and say, was my heart right in this situation? Did I steward the calling well? Have I led somebody in the mm-hmm. direction of a different resource? Yep. So I yep. think it's really important to distinguish the two roles and the two callings because it really does help us. Um, it, it helps us follow the Lord ultimately yeah. um, and to keep our integrity about us as we respond to feedback um, in different ways in the different circles. Yeah. Amy, thank you so much for sharing with us here on Encounter Grace a little bit of your heart, a little bit of your home and family and how God's led you. Thank you for following God's calling with Austin at Trinity in Greenville and then with the uh, tiny theologians and verse by verse in the online studies. I mean, really, we need this as a people. We need solid ways to get into scripture. Mm -hmm. And so thank you for following that. Um, Thanks for being here today. And again, in the description, there's uh, links to all of Amy's resources and go there. I mean, seriously, guys, girls, women, men, uh, go there and learn um, and you'll, you'll be blessed. So uh, share this, Encounter Grace, share this. If this has blessed you, encourage someone else with it and then come on back for the next episode. It's going to be great together. Take care. This is a ministry of Grace Fellowship Church in Kinston, North Carolina. Visit gracekinston.org or follow us on Facebook and Instagram.